Hi, I'm Byron Howard, and welcome to The Sarah O'Connell Show. Hi, I'm Jared Bush, and welcome to The Sarah O'Connell Show. Welcome to The Sarah O'Connell Show. Byron Howard, Jared Bush, welcome to The Sarah O'Connell Show. How are you both today? Fantastic. We're, How are you? Fantastic. I'm um, really good. good. I'm so excited to have you both on my show today. Before we get into all the amazing films that you've worked on, can you tell me what did you both aspire to be when you were growing up? Was that animation? Did you have favorite movies at the time? Oh, gosh. Uh, uh, well, I mean, I could start. I mean, I, I grew up loving movies. I, you know, I think I, uh, around when I was 10 years old, there was this around like 1978, 1979, there was like, Star Wars and Superman the movie and Close Encounters and Star Trek the motion picture. So I think that was very much in my head. I don't, I don't know if I knew I was, was going to be a filmmaker. I like to draw, but for the longest time, I couldn't figure out a way to make all that come together, like movies and drawing until I found um, animation back in the, in the 80s and 90s. And that's sort of how I got into, into this. And that's still a great part about, I think what Jared and I do as directors is that it's this great merging of art and music and uh, cinematography and choreography. I think we get to experience the best of best of all that. What about you, yeah. Jared? Where'd you come from? <laughs> yeah, no, totally. I mean, I'd say, you know, I think when I was growing up, I loved telling stories. That was something that my, my family always did. My parents and my grandparents are great storytellers. Um, I don't know that I ever thought it would be possible to get into this industry, you know? Uh, yeah. <laughs> even when I moved out from, from the East Coast, of the U.S. to Los Angeles, I just kind of wanted to get involved, and I didn't really know how. And it, it took quite a long time for me to figure out first writing, and then finding animation, and realizing this is the home that that uh, I'd always been searching for, and never knew it. And then teaming up with Byron, which was a dream come true. So for me, it was sort of like a discovery over the course of of many many years versus a target I had as a as a as a kid. Absolutely. And so first of all, congratulations on Encanto. I love it. It's such a joyous, colorful, an explosion of color the entire film is and magical film. But can you tell me where did that idea first come from? Was it kind of like the idea of family? Is that the starting point? It really, yeah. really was. I mean, yeah, you, you want to get, go jump in? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, Byron and I, when we were working on Zootopia, uh, we are both lifelong musicians and we knew that we wanted to do a musical as our next our next story that we told together. Um, uh, I just finished wrapping up on Moana with Lin-Manuel Miranda and mm -hmm. he wanted to, to, to create the definitive Latin American Disney musical. So the three of us early on got together and said, let's all right, what's the story going to be? And you always start with what do we all have in common? What, what is the, what is the thing that we want to say? And, and we all have these sort of large, somewhat uh, crazy extended families. And we said, we've never seen a Disney animated movie that really talks to extended family, talks to the complexities of family. And so early on, our research was just talking to our own families. And, and very quickly, we started to understand, we actually don't know our families as well as we think we do. They don't know us as well uh, as, as they think they do. Wouldn't it be great to tell a story that dives into that, that hopefully gives people tools to talk to each other and shows you like, yeah, you kind of only know people as one thing and there's so much more to that. So that's really where the genesis of the story came from. Mm -hmm. And so Encanto is Disney's 60th animated feature film. So you start off, you've got this idea of what you'd like to make a film about. How do you go from taking that to actually pitching it to Disney and getting it greenlit as a movie? It's a long process. And it's funny because our process, no one ever actually says it's greenlit. Even now, it's true. they're not officially greenlit. No, they haven't said yet. <laughs> We're still waiting. <laughs> so hopefully someday they'll do it. But it's it's weird. Well, like Jared and I, like he mentioned, we we really wanted to do a musical together. Lynn, uh, you know, joined that that team very early, and you know, uh, we knew we wanted to stay true to this ex uh, idea of perspective and an extended family. We didn't even know where it was going to be set though. And you mentioned how beautiful uh, Colombia is, but we knew it was going to be somewhere in Latin America, but it really took discovering Colombia through friends of ours who happened to be Colombian filmmakers, Juan Rendon and Natalie Osmo, who'd worked with us on the Zootopia documentary, who were Colombian. And they said, if, if you guys are looking for a place that is just filled with magical realism and color and music and diversity, it's like, you really should take a close look at Colombia. And man, they were, they were right. Mag Juan and Natalie became two of our principal consultants mm -hmm. on the show. They actually went on the, uh, the initial research trip with us to, um, Colombia and throughout the whole process we really leaned on them as well as our Colombian cultural trust which is about a dozen other people 
uh, experts in their field over the years, because it's this constant learning process as we're kind of writing and rewriting and boarding and reboarding. We do like eight different versions of the film to evolve it uh, before we, we get to the one that you see in the theater. So it, it is, it's every, every movie is this amazing five-year journey for us. We learn a lot about ourselves. And we learn a lot about our, our world around us. So it's incredible. Once you settled upon your, your theme and indeed the location where the movie is going to be set, can you tell me how you came upon the character of Mirabel and decided that that's going to be the lead in this movie? You know, she came in pretty early. You know, I think, um, you know, in the first few months, this notion that there would be this magical place uh, and in that place, people there, especially this family, would be given these, these magical gifts. Um, I think actually early on, I think it was Byron actually, um, did some early storyboards and we kept on talking about all these amazing members of the family, but then there was one child in this family who was left out who didn't receive a gift. And, and so I think early on when, when, when we had pitched it, when Byron first pitched it, people would see it and they'd immediately gravitate towards her and their heart would go out and they'd empathize with her. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think from, you know, from a few months in, we knew that's the character that we wanted to center the story around. But I think also, she was incredibly relatable to a lot of people. I think many people in their lives feel like they're surrounded with, you know, amazing folks all around them. And it's hard to see your own worth in that. I think that's a very much part of the human condition. And so knowing that we had this character that could be fallible, that was very human, that was relatable. Um, it was a really fun character to build our story around because she is seemingly less special than everybody else. Uh, and, I think the great flip of the story is that she starts to not only see her family differently, but her, she starts to see herself differently as well. And so you mentioned you actually went to Colombia, but can you tell me how else did you ensure that the the architecture, the the culture, the music, the the family dynamics were authentic? Oh sure, well I can talk about just the. Uh the facts about the the uh, details about Colombian culture. The, the tricky thing, of, <laughs> we, I don't think we realized before we went to Colombia that it is, a, 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 it's like many, many countries in one. It's like five or six countries all in one country. And I think we had no idea how awesome and diverse it was, but then, <laughs> then we came back and then the challenge is how do you get that into an 88, 90 minute movie? How do you represent that? And it was just, I honestly, I, we have to credit our, our Colombian cultural trust. We really asked for a lot of help constantly um, from uh, people who really knew, and not only uh, Colombians from one region, but from many, many regions. And that was very important for the diversity of the family, for the accuracy of the music, of the, the different uh, way people dance, you know, depending on where you are in the country, the music styles vary. So we really needed to do our homework. And we had to admit that we did not know nearly as much as, as we needed to. But again, the more specific we got, and this is true, I think Lynn would say of the music too, the more deeply uh, specific we got on the cultural accuracy and people's experience in Colombian families, the more universal it became. It's just like, just like Jared was saying, like that finding Mirabel, someone who has deep self-worth issues, deep issues with how she's contributing to her family, it's so common to human beings. And so I think that the wonderful thing about Encanto is just how that tapestry of color and architecture and music and dance. And it's, it's very, very accurate. And it's really done from a place of love. And I think that's where people can around the world, no matter where they're from Colombians as well, but, but where they really connect to it. And it's, it was, again, it's this, it's like going to college, like yeah. for reals new every time you do a new film. So it's like, again, it's a, it's a great learning experience. Yeah. The other thing is it's, it's highly collaborative. You know, we have dozens and dozens of people that are helping us Mm -hmm. that are really family to us and are storytellers in their own right. And so as we're moving forward, you're not just getting um, intellectual information. You're spending time, you're having dinner with people, you're hearing their family stories, those dynamics, um, and you're trying to get sort of things emotionally correct, you know, because mm -hmm. I think it's one thing for, for it to look book correct. It's something else for it to just feel right. Um, and that only happens by having many, many people along for the journey with you for years. You know, there's no, my parents said, there's no one research period. It's the entire length of the movie. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think it's really by having dear, dear friends 
help you every step along of the way is is the only way to do it. Another thing I love about the movie is, of course, the soundtrack. And one thing I love about that is that every single song has its own unique flavor, its own personality. And not only that, but if you listen to them, they're all moving the story forward too. Yeah. But can you, mm-hmm. can you tell me how you actually plan that? So obviously you're mapping the script out or whatever, but when do you go, right, this isn't going to be script, this part of the narrative is going to be told in a song? And which mm-hmm. comes first? <laughs> it's it's very chicken and the egg you know it's actually different depending on which song you're talking about um, right. uh, the opening song is a good example uh, the family madrigal song that's one that we knew that it needed to carry a lot of weight that there was going to be a lot of exposition to get out we wanted to do it in the most fun way possible and meet as many members of the family as possible and that's something that lynn was very excited to take on that <laughs> that responsibility and that challenge early so i think we always knew yeah that's probably going to be some sort of a set up family town uh, song that really dives into the personalities of different members of the family, even though they're, you're kind of seeing very intentionally the one dimensional version of them uh, and a sense of this place and the fun and Mirabelle herself telling you all these things rapid fire and sort of avoiding talking about herself. Uh, we also talked about other members of the family. We knew that we had 12 main characters that we wanted them to separate from each other. A great way to do that is to have the music itself feel different for each character. So Luisa, the strong member of the family, has this reggaeton that has a very specific driving beat. It's very contemporary, uh, where you have uh, Isabella, who is the, she kind of goes on a bender. And so having this rock and Espanol kind of anthemic rock song made a lot of sense for her. But the great thing about what Lynn can do is you associate those lyrics and that music style with that character, and it helps you separate as you're moving forward. We, we actually didn't know where each of those songs would land, but it made sense to us to have a central character like Luisa sing to us about how she's feeling, or Isabella to sing to us, and that was even a, a little bit of a duet with, with Mirabel. And then, of course, the giant in the middle of the movie ensemble song, We Don't Talk About Bruno, was a huge thing that, that, that came... I don't know, three quarters of the way through the process, this sort of, we're going to have this very um, uh, cheese made, this, this gossipy song in the middle where you get to hear a little bit from everybody and get to hear some of their personalities. Uh, that was actually more akin to a structure of a stage musical than it is to our typical Disney theatrical uh, musicals where in a stage musical, in the middle of it, you have this big number that sort of resets everything you hear from everybody. And that was really, really exciting. But I think knowing... First off, having Lynn with us from the very beginning of this journey five years ago and saying, we want to build this as a proper musical and lean into stage musicals allowed us to think about things in a way that we don't typically do. Or or if we do think about it, it's too late. We've already sort of gone all the way down a certain road. But this one, we really built the foundation with that in mind. Yeah, because I was thinking about that song in particular, because obviously you're not allowed to talk about Fight Club, and they say that they don't like to talk about Bruno, but I think the reason for that is they actually like singing about Bruno. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'd rather sing. It's much yeah. better if we all sing. <laughs> yeah, or dance, dance about yeah. Bruno, either one of those. Dance about Bruno, yeah. Yeah, they're fine. <laughs> one of my favorite, I, I love all the songs in the movie, but one of my favorite songs was Surface Pressure. Can you tell me what mm. yours are? Do you have a favorite? Oh my gosh, they're all, you know, we heard them come in over a period of about a year and a half as they yeah. deliver these demos. And uh, to your point, they're all so different. And he he really said he wanted to do that at the beginning of the process. And that's really to his credit, like the Colombian music is so diverse. And I think he felt like he could find a different style for each one of these characters. But, um, and Jared should speak to this because he and Sharice uh, wrote the script, but like the, the musical work that Lynn did on each character so informed the characters like I, I don't know that we fully knew who Luisa was until we heard that song right. and then that changed everything in the same way that um uh Dos Uruguitas, until that song came in which is actually pretty late in the process there was a part of Alma the uh the grandmother that I don't think we com- could completely comprehend until we saw how musically her backstory was going to be portrayed in in the movie but that's it's so great because I you know I think uh people underestimate how powerful and simple and beautiful and just right to the core of what people are feeling music can be. It's like, it's such a direct plug into your soul. And Lynn was so good at this. And you can tell like, he's so good at earwormy stuff. But the great thing is, as you mentioned, like everything is so custom built for each, um, each character. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I've been trying to persuade my entire family to have a custom song each as well, but they, they haven't gone along with it so far. Keep us so, posted. Yeah, you can sing it every time you walk into the house. I love it. It's how you recognize Darth Vader. You hear the music first. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, right? <laughs> so also during that song, Surface Pressure, there's a brief reference to Hercules. And I wondered, at any point during the production, did you consider probably you know what I'm going to ask you, putting the Disney classic version of Hercules into that song? Or can you tell me if Encanto exists in another universe to Hercules? <laughs> it's such a, it's, we get asked this a lot. I'd say that we actually 100% considered putting in the actual uh, Disney Hercules into that. Um, we have to build our characters way before we get music. And so one of the things that we found in this, and we had so many um, primary characters, you know, those 12 main characters that yeah. takes a lot of work to get all those done. And we have a bunch of animals. And I think by the time we got that lyric, we were sort of in this tough spot where, okay, you could get Hercules just for those 10 seconds, or you can have a capybara for the whole movie and which yeah. way you're going to go. And so we, I think Byron and I had to make the mature choice to, to, to have some, uh, more animal representation that could be in more of the movie than to have that one-off joke uh, with Hercules. But, but we did talk about it uh, uh, quite a bit, actually. Those are funny choices, though, because like with our weird job, it's a weird <laughs> choice. It'll be yeah. said, like years ago, I worked on a movie where the choice was we can either build this super tanker or a, a cute little chubby cat. And we needed the cute little chubby cat because he was like a really critical like part of the rest of the week. So bye bye super tanker. But it's amazing that those things cost the same <laughs> man, man week wise. But yeah, it's another wrinkle. Oh yeah, exactly. One thing is that Hercules exists in 2D primarily. And, you know, right. it's, it's a massive resource for someone to build a 3D character. And as, as, as you say, if you need a character for an entire movie, unless you have Hercules just working in the background. <laughs> It's less useful. You mentioned that Encanto was in production for five years. And looking back, do you have a favorite moment from production? Was it when it was all done? Was there a particular day you enjoyed or watching it with an audience? What's your favorite moment from that movie? Oh, wow. oh man. I, 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 I can tell you that I, one of the things I love, 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 like first off, the, enti the entire Every day it's something new. Yeah, I think that um, when you when we talk to people about like, yeah, we've been working on this movie for five years. It's never the same movie for those five years. It's always something different. Certainly our trip to Colombia was was unbelievable. And we had an amazing time there. That really stood out as like one of the most special times. For me, as a musician, I always love the scoring part of the process. When you get to be there with the orchestra and the soundtracks coming mm -hmm. to life, the reason I love it is because you can't change dialogue or picture. So it's like one of the few times where you can go and just enjoy some amazing music. Your work is somewhat done. Uh, and as a musician, it's, you know, it's like the greatest musicians in the world playing over top of this thing that is basically done. Um, and so it's one of the few times, at least for me, that I can just relax and enjoy the moment and not have to worry about having to change anything. So I, I really love that part a lot. Yeah, the whole last year, I'd say that includes that that score moment is, is really incredible for us as directors because we're we're with it to, from the very beginning when it's a blank yeah. page to the very very end of the process where you know like past award season and as the, as it gets into sort of streaming it kind of lives uh, its own life or goes out into the world or becomes part of the parks and so we have that continuity that almost no one else does and it's a huge gift to us uh, you know because we're so buried in the production but. I, I hope that the crew realizes how much they give to us during that last year as we're seeing yeah. their work come together. Like you see all the plans for like, we think the house is going to look like this. This is sort of the color on the wall. These are plants that we've built that are specific to Columbia. Lynn's demo sounds like this. The score that Jermaine did sounds like this. But when you see it all come together, I think we're as blown away week to week as anybody else. Yeah. I think it was because we just, it's all of these people working at their highest level. And then it all, the synergy that happens in the last six months when you see it done is is crazy it's like a crazy whirlwind experience and we're just we're exhausted by that time so we need it so there's something about that that's really <laughs> psych psychologically really really good about that moment. yeah i agree with that it must be so satisfying when you've had 
elements of the film just being worked on for years and years and planned and then you finally just see them all working together it's, it's like this interview I've planned this for decades but once this is recorded I'm gonna get a full orchestra on it <laughs> can't wait and I'm, I'm gonna be CG and <laughs> oh well you know you're, you're right though I'd, I'd say that what's really interesting is that um as all these pieces are coming together you of course plan as best you can but you know, we work with some of the, the most talented artists in the world. You and really so do, what, yeah. you, what you see at the end of the day isn't what you thought. It is that times a thousand. And people really, really care so much um, and spent a lot of time on these tiny, fine details that what you get is beyond anything you could ever have imagined for just one piece, let alone all the pieces together. So mm-hmm. it's incredibly emotional, to be honest. Like when you see it, you like it's you realize I think individually, everyone is just working so hard and putting their whole hearts into everything. And it's hundreds of people doing that concurrently. Mm-hmm. It's, it's uh, pretty spectacular. There's one little thing uh, that was a huge technological jump for us on the movie, which was Jared had this uh, idea about these tablets that Bruno would produce with his visions. And at first they were like just carved tablets or there's kind of like etchings. And he was like, no, that's not cool enough. It's like, what if we did like a hologram? And then the whole BFX, he went gulp. That's really, <laughs> that's really hard. But the crazy thing is that they took like a year and a half to figure out, like actually looking at how holograms work and creating new technology in our computers to simulate real. So it's, those are real, real life holographic behaviors that you're seeing on those tablets and the audience just takes it for granted like oh that looks like a cool hologram but there are so these people who are so smart have to figure that stuff out and then that gives us new technology yeah. the next time we go into more storytelling and it's just like a one one little aspect of it that was like wouldn't this be cool led to something that even pushes filmmaking in our studio further that's incredible so now you have to make sure that you have holograms in the next 10 movies you work all on holograms movies, exactly yeah. <laughs> Best holograms in the world. Yeah. <laughs> Watching the movie, you don't just watch it. You can see every decision that's been made, every person that's worked <laughs> on everything. And do you have a favorite Easter egg or tiny reference in the movie or a sound or something when you're watching that the people can look out for? Yeah, it's, it's so it's hard because there's, yeah, there's, one of the things I will say is that the, the attention to detail on the way that the fabric and the hair moves in this movie is not like anything I've ever seen before. So I, I don't know if I'd call it an Easter egg, but um, you know, we have so many characters, everyone has a different type of outfit. Each of those a- outfits are different types of fabric and then fabric on top of fabric. And the combination of, uh, I, I don't think those are our, our technical animation teams. I don't know that I've ever seen them blow it out of the water like they did on this movie. Like Every single time we'd sit down with that group, you're just like, I don't know how you're doing this, but we have heavy choreography through the entire movie, all different hair textures and styles. And then the way they brought that to life really allowed, I think the, the personality of the characters and the sense of rhythm and music to shine through. So like any frame in the movie, you're seeing that happen. Uh, it, it, it blows my mind literally every single time I see it. They did such a terrific job. Obviously, in the pandemic, I've not seen as many films in movie theatres. I've seen a few, but not every film that I would have liked to. And Encanto is one that I experienced on Disney+, Plus, but it's the one film that I need to see in a movie theatre. <laughs> it looks incredible. And I, I mean, I have a 4K TV, but I just I can imagine what it'd be like on the big screen. It is pretty special. It yeah. It's a game changer, really, because it is the, the detail is incredible. I think when... Uh, we started seeing it in our theater at work. Like there's during surface pressure right before Louisa starts singing, you can see like the back of her neck and like the, the fabric in her blouse and it's all hand done and so specific. And just like the, the, the giant amount of work that goes into everything just really comes across in the big screen. And you're right, like it's, it's super colorful. I have a 4K TV too and it's super colorful, but and it is so immersive on a, on a big screen. And it's just like the, the color pops and it just makes you feel like having been down there uh, I think Jared and I stepped into the Kokora Valley where they have those super tall palm trees that were so distinct. And we were like, this is where the Madrigal house has to be, has to be set in the environments that they built. And they were so true to Colombian vegetation and the architecture is this beautiful blend of so many uh, different parts of Colombia. It, it's, it is really a very immersive experience. So yeah, my hope is that people get the chance to see that in the theater again sometime soon. Now, this isn't a question. This is a statement. Congratulations. Encanto has been nominated for Best Original Score, Best Animated Feature. Amazing. 
And I thank wish you, you so the very best of luck. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so exciting. Previously, of course, Utopia won Best Animated Feature. How did that feel? You, you oh, work no, on a I mean, movie for all these years and you know it's good. And, you know, I mean, Disney always gets nominated for Best Animated Movie, but to win, how, how does that feel? It, it was really, uh, uh, it's so amazing and surreal. Again, because like no matter, like all these films you see get nominated, people have worked for years on them. Like it's an incredibly yeah. slow, uh, somewhat tedious process animation. And so the people who do it, I think are really doubly dedicated to making it a uh, great star studio and others as well. But that it's such a weird night. And like, the, I, we just finished watching the Olympics and like, there are a few things that I've ever been a part of that's sort of on the world stage, but I think because of that evening and like the amount of texts that we were getting after the film got the award, I, you're aware of how many eyes are on that moment uh, for your, for your film. And, uh, and then to see our, our crew so elated, you know, when we bring those uh, those uh, awards to the studio, like they're so proud to show their families them holding the the, uh, the Oscar and stuff like that. That was just that was remarkable. The next couple of days after that was pretty remarkable for us emotionally. I bet. And do you get to take an Oscar home, or do you have like one and you have to share it between the entire studio? How does that work? <laughs> or does they live in the it's studio? Pass it back right. No, they give you one. They give you one. They get to get to hang it. You know, put Amazing. it in, put it in your house. They're ever, they're very heavy. <laughs> Well, I have to work out a bit before I win an Oscar. Then. Thank <laughs> you for the heads up. There's some curls, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, Get a personal trainer to do my Oscar lifts. <laughs> Imagine if you went to pick it up and just fell over, though, it'd be a problem. Yeah. It's like, oh, no. It's very embarrassing. <laughs> Down I go. So, did you also actually direct the music video for Try Everything, Shakira's? song from Zootopia. You talk about that, Jared, how that came to be? To oh, that. yeah. I mean, that was super exciting. You know, that was a, an amazing collaboration between Sia and Shakira. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and um, I think I remember, like, when we first got the, the demo in from Sia, we're like, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. It's, it's exactly what uh, we want for this moment in the movie. And really, uh, for Judy Hopps' journey, felt exactly right. Um, but then, like, how is that going to translate to Shakira? And what is mm -hmm. her voice going to sound like? And I remember hearing like she went and took her pass and here it is. What do you guys think? And, you know, like it, it's, it's so interesting when you go from a demo to what the final thing will be in the movie, it always changes in a way that you can't expect. I can't imagine it any other way. Like, I think the way that mm -hmm. she approached it, um, you know, I think that the, uh, the, the great thing about Shakira is that she's such an optimistic person and that sort of that feeling that you got underneath that and the way that it sort of felt like, um, it really felt like she was speaking through Judy Hopps was, was incredible. So that was, uh, that was really, really, that was an amazing moment getting that piece of music in for sure. Yeah. Jared heard the demo before I did. Like he, he had the, he had the sort of the CD in his hand that I said, how'd, how'd you like it? And his eyebrows went up. He was like, just a little slight. He didn't want to like bias me, but I think he knew. I think once we both knew, it was like, oh, that's, that's the one. It's so positive and up and then, uh, and then even after the fact, like on social media, like there was a, uh, a group that did it in Mandarin. That was so cool. And it's just like, again, when, once these things go out and become part of world culture and people mm. take it in and adopt it as, as their own, I think that's just one of the best things that we can we possibly uh, experience the whole thing. It's just, it's, it's just great. Yeah, I, I love things like that. And listening to local performers doing movies in different languages and hearing different interpretations of songs as well is incredible. Oh, yeah. Mm. So good. Now, Jared, every time I've ever gone to a beach my entire life, I've spent a lot of time looking out at the sea and just imagining what country, I mean, I know what countries are out there now, but <laughs> when I was a kid, I used to just imagine what, you know, countries and worlds are out there and the people and the cultures and all that kind of thing. You wrote the screenplay for Moana. Can you tell me how the idea of that first came about? Oh, gosh. Yeah. Well, you know, actually, um, it's funny. Um, so Moana was already moving the same time Zootopia was. So I didn't actually join Moana until about a year and a half before it came out. Uh, and there were some, some larger story changes and character changes that happened. And right as I was ramping down to Zootopia, my brain was sort of in that like, must be done quickly mode. Um, and so it was a great time for me to bounce over. I, of course, always love musicals. Um, and so uh, for me on that movie, um, it was really exciting to, to dive into that world. Um, I'd say that, that the character of Moana was really fun and fascinating and, and writing her really as a, as a hero, first and foremost, I mean, it's really a hero's journey is the, the journey that she goes on. Um, and it's sort of this, this epic quest was really, really fun to write. And then on top of that, 
having this sidekick of Dwayne Johnson as Maui was, you know, it's like a dream come true. I'll say that that going from Zootopia, which is a kajillion animals, and you can have fun with all those guys at the same time all the time was amazing. And then going from that to two people on a boat, is a, it's a very different way of trying to tell a story. It, I always say it's almost like like writing a stage play where it's just you have nowhere to hide basically so it really comes down to these character dynamics and interactions and and watching them press off of each other so it was a really fun it was a really fun journey and exercise for me working on that movie here's a question that i ask every guest on the sarah o'connell show can you both tell me a fun fact about you something we may not know a hobby a party trick something like that oh my gosh well we have a lot of things in common this is this, sure will, this will blow your mind jared and i are both trombonists yes yeah. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Amazing. We share we share a lot of weird stuff. We're both scared of heights. We both love snickerdoodle cookies. Both born in Asia. They, they, they go on and on. The coincidence. <laughs> I love that. What do you got, Jared? Oh man, uh, I'd say that uh, um, lifelong animal lover. I've had many a different type of animal in my day. Probably as pets, I've probably had like 15, 20 different species of animals living with me at some point. So um the the journey of zootopia was near and dear to my heart because i got to hang out with a lot of those animals um some of them treated me nice some some didn't uh there's some heartaches in there <laughs> but always <laughs> always had a great time and my final question have you got any messages for people watching the sarah o'connell show and your fans around the world uh well just uh, just thank you for for watching everybody we're so excited i mean it's like the the best part of our jobs that these these movies um go out into the world and seeing people again like make them make them their own it's like i think for me i one of the reasons i work at disney is because of the legacy and this is like the 60th animated film it's so much part of who i was growing up is kind of learning uh about the world through these movies and so it's yeah I, i'm just like th thank you for all the enthusiasm that everyone's shown that's wonderful thank you yeah i, I totally stuck at that i also say that ask your family questions, ask your friends questions, because um, they're probably going through more than you know, and they probably don't share it easily. Uh, but I think one of the things that we definitely found and, and talked a lot about on Encanto was just, uh, yeah, everyone everyone has their burdens that they keep to themselves. And, and if we talk to each other more, we might see each other better. I love that. Byron Great. Howard, Jared Bush, thank you so much for coming on my show today. And thank you for a lifetime of entertainment. Oh, it was thank a pleasure. You, thank you so, so much, fun. Sarah. And thank you to everybody watching at home. Be sure to share, subscribe, give this video a big thumbs up and leave lots of lovely comments. And I'll see you all again soon for another episode of the Sarah O'Connell Show. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs>